is it the chicken or the egg? Um, so that's one of those questions as a, even as a kid, we used to play with, right? Which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Uh, and so sometimes we wonder what comes first? Is it, is it the individual or is it the community? Is it the individual or the group? And Giselle just answered the question. So I wanna, the, what comes first is the environment. What comes first before the chicken or the egg is the farm. This is Rob Johnson, president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with two friends, Giselle Huff, who's the head, she's the founder and president of the Gerald Huff Fund for Humanity, and also John Powell, INET board member, but more importantly in this world, he's the director of the Othering and Belonging Institute at University of California, Berkeley, and he's also a professor of law, African American studies and ethnic studies also at Berkeley. Uh, John has been a mentor to me for many years. Giselle, we met two, three years ago and you were an inspiration almost immediately. And uh, I, so I'm very excited today because they convened a group which I had the good fortune to participate in on the questions related to automation and the various, how do I say, visions of opportunity and belonging and a way to get beyond some of the, what I'll call, frightening and divisive turbulence that haunts us all at this time. They created what I would call a North Star, a vision, which we'll explore in this conversation, which directs us all in the long term to a place where we create and build and educate people into a better society than the one we see right before us now. Thank you both for joining me. And uh, let's start with, with Giselle. First of all, how did you meet John and how did you guys decide to get together and, and do this report? What inspired you? So um, I, it was my plan to, to do this convening that created the report. But I was well aware that, you know, Giselle Huff, founder and president of the Gerald Huff Fund for Humanity, was not enough to get this going in any meaningful way in terms of uh, bringing people on board that would have the heft to, uh, you know, to give this status. So through uh, Wendy Aki, who is, was both a participant mm -hmm. and also is a collaborator of John's, um, I started a campaign to get introduced to John and eventually got to speak to him on the phone while I was at a conference on my cell phone while people were walking by and got him interested in this project and eventually uh, he agreed, uh, much to my delight, to become a co-sponsor uh, so that the uh, now we had the gravitas that we needed in order to make this a success. And I would say from my own experience, John is kind of a North Star in guiding and direction of many things INET does. So maybe we needed a, a North Star to help us create a North Star. <laughs> John, what, what inspired you to join this project and get, uh, how do you say, roll up your sleeves and, and uh, head out to space? Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Roz, for hosting us. Um, and so, as they say, I was waiting for years to be to get that in that conversation with yourself. So when it finally happened, uh, I was delighted. And um, I think the visions that she brought to this was just so important, uh, not just for this project, but for the whole country, if not the whole world. Um, and the ability to sort of step back and look at where we are going and where we want to be in a generation and to invest some time and energy and resources into that, uh, I think is extremely, extremely important. And it may be hard to sort of appreciate just how important, given that there we have so many immediate crises that we have to deal with. Uh, but um, we always have crises, uh, some big, some small, uh, but the future's coming whether we're ready or not. So this seemed to me a project to help us be ready and participate in bringing that future forward. Giselle, recently you made a uh, podcast with a woman named Becky Pringle, who's a uh, 
Uh, she's the president of the National Economics, excuse me, National Education Association. And I was really taken aback on, I think the name of the podcast was Common Ground. I was really taken aback by your interaction with her about when you met, you had very different perspectives on what a reimagined education should look like. But by focusing on that North Star of that project in the distance, you found a great ally in somebody that at the outset, how you say someone less thoughtful might have found as an adversary. Did that inspire you in the construction of this, the, the experience that you had with that 27 person group along with Becky? Absolutely. Uh, when I founded the uh, General Health Fund for Humanity, which is named in memory of my late son who died of pancreatic cancer at the age of 54 in 2018. Uh, when I founded the fund and I looked around because my his passion was universal basic income and my mission is to forward that idea, but that idea is only part of a much greater idea that he captured in a techno thriller he wrote called Crisis 2038, which is a fiction portrayal of what will happen in 2038 if we don't do something now, if we don't start doing things now. And of course, doing something now means having something to go for, a goal to reach. You can't just do things without knowing where you're going. Mm -hmm. So when I uh, got involved before, way before he died, uh, with the Education Reimagined experience, uh, which uh, was we arrived at a North Star for K-12 education. And my and the result of that exercise was this lifelong friendship that I've established with Becky Pringle. Mm. And I looked for where I could make investments in the fund in, 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 in activities, initiatives that would move this along, his, his passion, his ideas. Um, I decided that I needed to do the same kind of thing for the future of the social contract, if you will, mm -hmm. um, that I had done for K-12 education, that I had participated in K-12 education. Yeah. So that's how I got, you know, I, I brought together and I, I hired the Consensus Building Institute, yeah. the same facilitators that did such a great job when Becky Quino and I were involved. Hmm. Was, it, they, was it Toby and, and David worked with that project as well? Oh, yes. Toby yeah. and the yeah, Consensus absolutely. Building they Institute. They were the facilitators. They were the writers of the Education Reimagined Equivalent ah, Document, okay. the North Star document for that yeah. organization. Yeah. So, and you know, the experience here wasn't nearly as dramatic because we couldn't be together. We had to be you know, on, on, on Zoom, given that this happened in 2020. Uh, in our case, with the education, we, we actually met two and a half days, five times. And when you break bread, you know, when you look into people's eyes and you share a glass of wine and you hear their life stories, you're in a different place than when you you know, participate in something with Zoom. Yeah. When I was a little boy, my father used to say to me, this was in Michigan, in the Detroit area, and he'd say to me, when you get into a dispute, always meet with someone. And I said, mm -hmm. why, Dad? He said, because if you let them think you're a dragon, then you're a dragon. When you meet with them, you're a human. Yeah. And they're not a dragon anymore. And I, how do I say, it obviously requires some skills in issue, things like... Uh, What's his name? Nathaniel Rosenberg's book, uh, Nonviolent Communication, and, and so forth, to make those personal interactions yeah. uh, a, a healing. But I think it did make things much more complicated to be only online for our group, uh, given the large size and uh, number of people. Let me just uh, put together a, uh, a list of the people who are co participants. And then I'm going to ask you, how did you get this wonderful roster? Because uh, you you had to, you, you shaped a very interesting group of people. As you mentioned, Wendy Aki from uh, 
John's Othering Belonging Institute, Reverend Jennifer Bailey, who is the Executive Director of Faith Matters Network, Robert Biko Baker, Executive Director of League of Young Voters, Whitney Campbell Cove, Director of National Programs in the Center for Rural Strategies, Sarita Gupta, Director of Future of Work and Workers Program at the Ford Foundation, Derek Hamilton, who's now uh, I believe at the New School in the head of an institute for uh, study of race stratification and political economy. Uh, Giselle, myself, John, Livia Lamb, Vice President of Federal Relations Strategies 360, Richard Murphy, brilliant man, editor-in-chief and director of ServiceNow, John and my friend Manuel Pastor, distinguished professor of sociology, American studies, ethnicity, and he's a director of USC Equity Research Institute. And I don't believe that's about the stock market. I think that's about the human condition, but <laughs> I'll just make that clarification. Uh, uh, Ann Price, president of the Insight Center. William Rogers, professor of public policy, chief economist of the John Day Heldrich Center for Workforce Development at Rutgers University. Scott Santens, a very bright man, senior advisor of Humanity Forward, and Andrea Saveri from Saveri Consulting, who I know, Giselle, you held in very high regard, related to the education dimension, which is a part of this report. But how did you, how did you, what was the process? How did you bring together this roster of people? Well, to, this to, was done at the suggestion, some of the suggestions that John made. Okay. And and uh, actually, some of the connections that uh, the uh, Consensus Building Institute had. And once you have someone like John on the roster, and you can bandy mm -hmm. his name about, mm -hmm. um, you do get more bites, you know. Uh, people are interested in participating in something with uh, a person of, of the stature that John has. So it, it, we lost a couple, three people on the way, but we actually, you know, stuck it out with the 16 people uh, and they were all signatories. It's one mm -hmm. thing to come up with a work product. It's another for people to actually put their names to it and yes. be willing to be recognized as, you know, creators of it. And we, that was not a problem. So the, the whole exercise was a real success, both in terms of the content and of the process, mm -hmm. considering the, what we were facing, the, the coronavirus. Well, John, uh, I'll use the analogy of a moonshot. Maybe you're the Neil Armstrong that inspired all of these good people to come together. But how did you see, what were you looking for in putting together this team? Uh, what Giselle mentioned earlier in terms of starting her foundation part and her son, uh, looking at um, uh, universal basic income and the future of work, which is a big issue. I live in the Bay Area in Berkeley, uh, work closely with uh, a number of community groups, but also foundations and tech companies looking at automation and the future of work. And uh, there's some, been ex some experimentation out here with the universal basic income. Uh, and so I think... Um, as, as people look up, they see, again, the future is sort of rushing toward us. Uh, automation is here. Um, and, um, and, and I, I appreciate Giselle's uh, characterization, but I think she could reach anybody she wants to just using her own name. Uh, um, you know, I think people respect her for obvious good reason, but I also think the issue is really pressing. Uh, and one of the difficulties is that it's pressing in a pressing time. Uh, Giselle mentioned that we have not met in person. I hope it, uh, maybe one day we still will meet in person as a group, because I think it is a different energy, uh, a different kind of uh, exchange, Rob, that you mentioned from your, your dad. Um, so I think that the, the trick is, how do you keep people's attention when there's so many things pulling on their attention? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think all of us have, you know, get stretched way too thin. Uh, and yet, uh, these issues are so important. And also, I, I appreciated what you talked about in terms of Giselle interacting with other people who may have differences. Mm -hmm. well, There's a book that. I recommend called High Conflict by Amanda Ripley. Uh, she talks about how to move from high con conflict to uh, essentially productive conflict. Conflict is going to happen. Mm -hmm. but how do you make it something that's productive? 
And in fact, if it's productive, we learn from it. We, we, we sharpen our understanding. We, we see our blind spots. Uh, so I think having a large group of people, not everyone agreeing on everything at the outset, but to work things through makes this a better project uh, product. Mm -hmm. uh, so really delighted to be a part of it. And I think, uh, I hope it gets a lot of play uh, going forward as people think about these issues. Yeah. Well, I find it fascinating because that roster I read off, you got people coming from all different places. We'll talk about the issues in the report, but they're what you might call subset. Uh, everybody's focused on a subset, but how did how you all got everybody to focus and come together? Not only on a deep dive about this issue or that, but the integration across multiple issues. And uh, I think the... Uh, how do I say? I, I was I just marveled at the conversations. Mm -hmm. Like it, it almost looked like a whole bunch of butterflies, and then it all converged, mm -hmm. and it looked like the geese that are flying at the you know f f migrating at the, at the, in the fall. Everything was in formation at the end, and uh, I didn't feel any coercion or intimidation or anything in the process. And, uh, so, you, uh, how do I say? You you both you each are quite artful, and I think. Uh, you brought good people to the table, and then we started to, how do you say, paint a picture for right. that future. Now, and one the facilitation of those... was, as, as, as uh, I just said, I mentioned earlier, the facilitation was not, was important as well. Having oh, yeah. good facilitators who can help people hear each other, uh, Toby and others, they did a really great job. That's right. That how is the say... thing, people hearing people. Yeah. If you yeah, don't they, they, listen, they, they, they kept the... Uh, even the electronic boxing gloves from being put on. And uh, I never saw a real breakdown. I, you know, I saw fervent discussion, like you say, the kind that Ripley would talk about as being constructive and illuminating, but not, it never got off the rails in my view. But, uh, so let's talk a little bit about the key issues that you talked about. There was, I, I enjoyed the fact that there was a background acknowledgement that there are what you might call processes in society, but we weren't going to go into the means we were looking at the ends. And so, but you did state as a background that we won't be there unless we have a healthy and responsive democracy and we have a healthy planet so that we can continue to live in a place as a society. And so those, those underpinnings then took us to a whole constellation of issues. And I'll just, you know, how we can make technology enabling, how the communities are communities of belonging, how we embrace different identities, how liberatory education brings people authentically into those communities and respect for their identity. And I just felt like this, these interactions were extraordinary and, uh, and I say the principles that you wove into a coherent design was great. But how did which ones resonated with you? What what got your how do you say excitement? Your what made your heartbeat trigger off and go up? When I think about Rob, and I know Rob, uh, your listeners may not know, but Rob has been very active in both the television, but the movie and the uh, music industry. Yeah. And it'd be like saying. Uh, what do you like better, the, 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 the drum or the uh, guitar? It's the drum and guitar together. That's, That's what right. I like. <laughs> you know? That's right. uh, so then you have great solo players, but when you put them together, then you got something special. And I think the, the various issues, uh, and again, in some ways you could say, when we think about the future, uh, there are many different ways of thinking about it in terms of climate change, in terms of demographics, the stuff that's coming out of the census. Um, you, you, you have to think about technology. Um, and those things are interactive. And some of them sort of uh, inspire fear. Uh, uh, any of them can inspire fear. I mean, certainly the changes that are happening in the climate, uh, but also when people think about uh, AI and technology and automation, uh, mm -hmm. we can think, we sort of almost keep that thought at bay because it's so scary, we don't understand it. Uh, and so things that we don't understand, it's easy to fear and just sort of put our heads down. Uh, so I like the fact that we're pulling all these things together. And, and so when you think about uh, uh, technology, when you think about climate, uh, when you think about 
people themselves, that we're a diverse world, uh, and it's always been a diverse world. The United States has been at the forefront of that experimentation, and we're being called to live together, not in our each in our little box, that we have a shared box. Uh, and the way you do that, in part, is through education. Education is a key. Thomas Jefferson made the observations that people aren't born citizens, they're made citizens through education. We're, not, we're doing a pretty poor job right now. We're not educating people to be citizens. And some people may be surprised that I'm quoting Thomas Jefferson. I'm well aware, well aware he had 200 enslaved people, even though he wrote the Declaration of Independence. Uh, uh, he struggled. He was imperfect, uh, like all of us. Um, but he also said part of being a citizen is learning to take the other person's perspective. Mm -hmm. And in this mm -hmm. society, in this, right now, in this world right now, we're just the opposite. We're, we're trashing the other person's perspective. We don't even want to hear. So I think all of those together can create a really beautiful symphony, beautiful, but the beautiful tapestry, but not one by themselves. They all have to be together. So the thing that excites me is bringing all these things, different threads together. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm going to play with your reference to my own musical background because in, in its relation to technology, because technology is both tremendous potential and you say at times frightening. I'm very frightened of drum machines because I think it stops that improvisational sensitivity and interaction and it makes the, I'll call the music more saccharine than if you have humans who might be not mathematically right on the beat, but if they're a little behind or a little ahead, that, that has feeling. And so there are times when I think technology is not uh, what you might call nirvana. But on the other hand, I think being too afraid of it, you're, I say, missing a great deal of opportunity. But Giselle, you uh, had lots of experience exploring through these issues, and in many ways you were a pioneer in the education realm. What 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 caught your fancy as uh, as the report started to unfold or come together as a vision? So the what I really appreciated was the fact that at the core of this report is the individual, and it's like you know peeling the the onion in order to place to make. The, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness a reality. You have to create an environment within which the individual can thrive. Mm -hmm. and what this report does by picking out the environmental factors that are prevalent in the 21st century, like automation, like the lack of community that has been, you know, growing because of all of the political divisions that we've been living through. Um, as you look at it, and, and the, the, the outer circle of the graphic that they've created in this report, the healthy planet and the healthy democracy, which are like mm -hmm. fundamental but all of the elements that bear on the individual, both as the individual develops relationships with the community, and for me, belonging is the biggest thing. And I'm taking away your thunder, <laughs> John, because that's the name of your organization. But really, belonging is at the bottom of many of the strifes that we're going through now. People don't feel that they belong. Which is why, as an aside, UBI is a unifying factor because if everybody gets a thousand dollars a month, everybody is everybody. Mm -hmm. So it's very subtle. It's not, you know, but it is. A, so that's what we need to be looking for, and I, I think that's what this document addresses. It shows how the four different um, influences on a human being in the context of the environment in which they live, can be fashioned, can be set up, so that they enable that individual to be empowered and to feel like they belong, which are the two things that, you know, an agency, with that they feel that they have control, the three things, that make for happiness. As much happiness as we can find you know, in this veil of, veil of tears. So, um, to me, it, this document captures that. 
And Rob, if I could just add a little bit to what Del just said. Um, I think it's really important. You know, I, one of the preeminent questions we always get is, is it the chicken or the egg? Um, so that's one of those questions as a, even as a kid we used to play with, right? Which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Uh, and so sometimes we wonder what comes first? Is it, is it the individual or is it the community? Is it the individual or the group? And Giselle just answered the question. So I want to, what comes first is the environment. What comes first before the chicken or the egg is the farm. And normally we don't have to pay attention to the environment. It's just there. It's the container that we live in uh, and take for granted. We normally don't think about, can I breathe the air? That's right. Right? But when we can't breathe the air, we think about it a lot. Uh, and so what, what we're facing right now is we have cracks in the container. The very things that hold us, the very things that give us air and light and food and water. Literally, I'm in California, and we're talking about running out of water. A friend of mine just visited, uh, his name is Paul Hudson, he, was, he lives in LA. He's lived in his house for almost 30 years. There's a creek that runs through his property. He says for the first time, in the 30 years that he's lived there, the creek is dry. Uh, so we have to attend to the container uh, if we are going to thrive as individuals in our community. And we haven't really done that very well. Most of the time we're just taking it for granted. And what the report is calling our attention to is that even as we empower the individual, we have to make sure the container is there and working for us. That's so well put, John, but, and it's also very true that the, the, the container, you know, the earth is the major, you know, the fundamental container, but our institutions are the containers right. too. Exactly. exactly. And we've totally ignored how they've gone awry. Right. Now, I just watched a uh, wonderful forthcoming documentary on the question of water and how water being commodified is now destroying the farms and driving up the price of agriculture and how water should be, which you might call part of the common good. Uh, it's a forthcoming documentary that uh, I was just asked to have a view, uh, or give them some feedback on, but it resonates exactly, John, with what you were saying about, uh, how do I say, the devastation of the farm, the devastation and they were talking about all kinds of creeks drying up. They're talking about all kinds of places in the middle of California yeah. that can't function any longer. And obviously that has all kinds of social ramifications as well. Yeah. John, Other and Belonging Institute. I've always thought that there's a synonym for othering. I call it fear. Hmm. Othering rarely makes sense. And if we're talking about humanity, othering within humanity has got very, very toxic mm -hmm. effects. You and I each grew up in Detroit. We had a lot of experience with othering. Mm -hmm. But how, in this vision of the North Star, with the declaration, if you will, that othering has no role, how do we ward off the fear that allows it to grow? Yes. Well, you know, it's, it's a question that's actually faced uh, people uh, for much of, much of our lives. Um, you know, I sort of remind people, if you think about uh, Western civilization, uh, and Hobbes is sort of considered one of the chief architects of political philosophy uh, out of the West, uh, and Rousseau is another. So they both looked out at the world, and they both saw a world that was a little bit scary. Uh, and, and Hobbes idea was that we're in a state of nature where all is against all. So we entered the state to create these institutions to protect ourselves from each other. Uh, but then he goes on and he says, but in doing so, we give up power to the state that's supposed to protect us from each other. And now we have to protect ourselves from, our, from the state. <laughs> and as you read him on, he's obviously brilliant, but he sounds like a little bit paranoid. It's like, you know, it's on and on, it never stops. 
uh, Rousseau uh, looks out and sees the world as scary as well. And what does he say? that the way you deal with the fear and uncertainty of the world is solidarity. You deal with it by holding on to each other. So one vision is that the world is scary and therefore it's all against all. We're in a constant state of fear. Everybody wants my stuff. Uh, and so I'm going to get my gun and my tank and my, you know, uh, charged fence and, and my boundaries and my wall. Uh, and then I'm still afraid. Not only am I afraid now, I'm also lonely. Uh, so that strategy constantly tearing us against each other and even against ourselves uh, generates not safety, but loneliness. When you think about it, half the guns, civilian guns in the world are in the United States. But we're not the most safe country, uh, just the opposite. Uh, right. So right. Rousseau says, don't turn on each other, turn toward each other. How do we do that? We need help. We need, as just Hell said, we need institutions. We need, I just did a special on Detroit, our, our hometown route, and we talked about, in the special, we talked about uh, the, the wall of, uh, of uh, I forget what it's called now, but where they build a wall to keep the black and white communities separate in Detroit uh, so they could get along. Uh, that wall is still there. Uh, yeah. That's the Hobbesian model. Uh, so I think that, uh, and I think Giselle is right, that really, can we belong to each other? Can we belong without othering? Can we have a we without, and so my students and others say, well, is that even possible? That's our orientation. That's what we should be reaching for. We don't know how far we can go in it. Uh, and it's not just a psychological or emotional space. It's an institutional space. We can create institutions that help us, or we can create institutions that hurt us. And Jim Crow and segregation were institutions that says, you don't belong together, you can't be together, it's against the law. Yep. Uh, so how do, we turn, how do we turn that around? Uh, and the last thing I'll say on this is that we, I think we largely squandered the opportunity given to us by the pandemic. What do mm -hmm. I mean by that? The pandemic had lessons to teach us. One lesson was, yeah, you need to maybe get a shot, you need to maybe have physical distance from each other, but you're in this together. The whole world, almost 8 billion people, is experiencing this at the same time. There was one period where more than half the world was in lockdown. It's the first time in human history that's ever happened. So it created this possibility to say, what is happening to you affects the person literally and figuratively next to you. You're not in this alone. You're constantly impacting each other. Uh, so how do you turn toward each other and resolve this crisis together? That's the only way we can resolve the crisis. And that's not just true of the pandemic, it's true of uh, AI, uh, it's true of uh, the climate. We're, we're constantly being pushed to work together. Uh, but as you said, Rob, fear gets in the way. Uh, so. I think we need help, we need stories, we need examples, we need institutions, we need models. Uh, we can bridge, but we have to do it. Well, the uh, idea that you bring together, which is what I will call all of these disruptors, not necessarily, disruptor does not mean bad, it just means profound change. So technology and the environment as disruptors. These kinds of things, globalization, the notion that the nation state can manage the well-being of its citizens when all of these, how we say, influences from all around the globe come ripping through the society. All of this is very, very, uh, what you might call, catalytic to fear. And so the North Star, with the declaration of belonging, seems to be, to me, the, the right vaccination for the heart. Right. I think you I think you guys really, I said, well, I guess I was part of it, but uh, the team that you inspired really did a, a very good job by emphasizing that as, and I, if as, I can, as the essence. If I can just add one thing, because we haven't given enough play to this, in my opinion. Um, 
at the at the root of all of this is education. Mm -hmm. uh, Plato in the Republic, when he's describing his perfect ideal society, he says, just give me the kids. Let me have the children and I will mold them into the kinds of people who will be able to live under the rule of a philosopher king. And one of the wonderful parts about this report is that it doesn't call for liberating education. It calls for liberatory education, which keeps on coming up underlined red in documents because it's not a word that's accepted, I guess. Uh, it's, it's not recognized by spell check. But liberating means that you are freed from the you know, shackles of a rigid traditional education, which is what people are talking about. That's what the people in my field for 23 years were talking about. But liberatory is a deeper concept. It means educating yourself and keeping track of how you're learning so that you can adjust, that you can open your mind, that you can listen to other people, and you can make the things that this document calls for happen. You take a five-year-old child or a three-year-old child in preschool and you train them with that in mind, mm -hmm. and you'll have a different world in a generation. Right. But if you don't do that, there's not enough you can do fast enough to get to where you want to be. Yeah. Well, and Rob, John, let me just throw out one other please. thing, and I, I've been sitting on this, and I don't want to be nitpicking. Actually, I actually tried to catch this before the final report went out. But I hope this report has resonance not just in the United States, but the entire world. Mm -hmm. As we think about the world, we have to remember that the North Star is only in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, so we may need a slight variation as, to, as this report and these ideas travel to the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah, the penguins are in the South and the North Star is in the North. And the Galapagos Islands is the only place north of the equator where the penguins thrive. So we got we to create a Galapagos. <laughs> and well, I want to come back, uh, Giselle, a little bit to your sense of education, because in the last couple of years, I've been doing a lot of work with a group called Scholarly Encounters, Scuola Socrates, uh, that Pope Francis inspired. And when we get together, he emphasizes that much of the world does not go to college on the order of about 80% of the young people. Second thing, he says they will drop out of high school to get a wage out of economic anxiety to help their family or whatever, unless what they learn in school gives them what you might call skills in navigation of the context in which they live to better themselves. And so his remedy is to empower the young people to tell us what they want to learn, not live downstream in a vertical environment that's a one-way street where people come in and tell them what they have to learn. And he's bringing this around and saying, if we don't do this and these people drop out, then 80% of the people in the world are not suited to navigate through the fear, address change, understand the difference between expertise and somebody who's yanking your chain, and democracy cannot thrive. So education, empowered by the yearnings of the young, seems to me to be a necessary condition. And I remember in conversations with you and in, in discussions in this report that, that which you might call interactive nature of education, the empowerment of the young, of the student, is very important. And as an existential education, too. I mean, not just learning things, not just the, the acquiring of knowledge, but the development of skills and dispositions and experiences where children are put through what it means to be a democracy, put through what it means to punish someone who goes outside the norms. How do you come to a resolution of a problem? What happens when two kids are in strife with each other? 
How do you, how does the community deal with that? This could be built in to the education system every day. If only it was structured that way. This is not rocket science. We have plenty of people who understand these things. And it would, and, and you know, not everyone is an intellectual or can be an intellectual or wants to be an intellectual, mm -hmm. right? Everyone has their own capacity and we should have room for that. We should, this is what this document says, Thank make you. room for everybody. Mm -hmm. Acknowledge everybody's uh, deserving to be on this earth. They're here, they deserve to be here. I remember when I moved from New York, where I lived for 30 years, and went through the whole social you know, thing in New York. It, it was the, you know, the cocktail party in New York. When people started talking to you, they asked you three questions. Where do you live? Where do you work? And where do your children go to school? Mm -hmm. And unless you answered those questions correctly, they just turned away and moved on. When I moved to San Francisco, those questions were never asked. If I was in the room, I belonged there. Mm -hmm. There was no need to further identify me. And in the same way, we have to do that to all the people in the world. If they're on, in this world, mm -hmm. they belong there. They don't have to prove it. Well, John, you, you'll both be very, uh, you can chuckle at my divided personality living in Bolinas and New York City. <laughs> I cross those boundaries in what you might call the rituals of the game mm -hmm. uh, of what allows you. I mean, if you can read a poem, you're pretty good in Bolinas. And uh, like you said, schools, credentials, who you work with in New York is more the, uh, the currency of, you know, entry pass or whatever to conversation. Well, I think that's right. I mean, I want to just underline what Giselle said and just maybe even push it a little bit further. Because um, today, people think of, we shifted at some point from thinking of education from Jefferson's idea of making people citizens. What was he talking about? <laughs> learn to take someone else's perspective. He's talking about bridging. That's what bridging is, learning to take someone else, learning to hear someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, and at, at one level, education has become technical training. We learn how to do things. We don't learn how to live together. Those are two different skills. That's right. uh, and so today we spent much more time educating the mind and not educating the heart. Exactly. Uh, and Giselle's point is that Everybody belongs. Everybody belongs. It's not provisional. It's not like you belong if you go to a fancy school, or if you belong if you get a fancy degree, or you belong if you have enough money. No, everybody belongs. That's what we have to understand. And then how do we live that out? How do we make that real? How, how do we say every child that born is deserving? Every one of them. Not just black ones, not just white ones, but everyone. That's, that's what's really tearing us apart, is that we're saying some people are deserving and some people are undeserving. And we do that by race, we do it by religion, we do it by nationality, we do it by neighborhood. Uh, and and so to me, that's the real part of education that's problematic. I'm, I'm at Berkeley, a great school, uh, but too often, not just Berkeley, Stanford, sometimes we're very proud of our engineering department, and we should be, but we're not so proud of our sociology and psychological department. We're not doing, Rob, what you said in terms of that book, Nonviolent Communication. How do we learn to talk to people who disagree with us? How do we learn to hold on to each other's humanity? That's the hard lesson. And so we have to broaden education uh, to really talk about connecting, to talk about love, to talk about everybody belonging. And so it's not just a insipid concept, it actually has meaning. Yep, I uh, often in this podcast recently around these themes have cited the late Jane Jacobs' final book in 2004. It was called Dark Age Ahead. And chapter three was called Education, excuse me, Educating versus Credentializing. Hmm. And it dealt with exactly which you might call that different purpose, that becoming an input to production. People like Sir Kenneth Robinson, who's got the most famous TED Talk of all time, How Schools Kill Creativity. I saw an RSA animates about one of his speeches about when you take out 
how do I say, the criteria for a genius, and you test children in kindergarten, 70% to 80% show the potential to be a genius. By the time they're in 10th grade, it's less than 5%. Because the, the nature of what learning and education means is so narrow. And as you mentioned, it's head-based, not heart-based. There's a wonderful book by a man in South Bend, Indiana, who used to be a lawyer, and I think then worked with the ministry for a while. And it's called The Lost Art of Heart Navigation. His name is Jeffrey Nixon. And he gets right to the core of the kind of things that I was able to sit at a Zoom lens and grin about as your group was talking. Mm -hmm. And as you just uh, emphasized yourself. And I think this is, this is part of an awakening. I'm gonna take it to a place that isn't in our report, but something that affects uh, I'll say I need quite a lot. As you know, we've had a lot of interaction with uh, Asia. And I have a friend who uh, is a great scholar on foreign policy and so forth named Patrick Lawrence. He wrote a book in 2011, I believe it was, called Somebody Else's Century. Mm-hmm. He was a protege of Chalmers Johnson, who had been at University of California at Berkeley, and wrote all about Japan. But his theme is that that notion of we and all of us that is in Eastern philosophy, whether it's Japan or India or China or whatever, is not going to accept what you might call the market-based rugged individualist model, the self-protective alone me in the market model that is prevailing in the United States. I think we're at a crossroads in terms of what you might call defining the North Star for world leadership. I think the United States is being challenged if your North Star was not just words, but the modus operandi of this country. I think our coalition would be broadening Mm -hmm. rather than narrowing. But that contrast that Lawrence puts out between Eastern philosophy, which has a lot more heart-based elements to it, the Tao Te Ching and other things, or some parts of Indian philosophy, and what I'll call Cartesian logical thinking, it's, it's a big challenge. And mm-hmm. opening up education in those realms, which Giselle, I think you would agree, Northern California does a better job of than New York City, <laughs> and, or probably a, put Detroit on the same side as New York City in that regard. But, but this, this notion of education and the resilience of the spirit of our citizens in defining and enforcing in actively yearning for that North Star. Education is essential in reading. Mm-hmm. And, and education comes in many different forms, formally yeah. and otherwise. I mean, my, my, my father died recently. Some of you heard me talk about him. He was 99 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some indication that he died of COVID, but he was at the beginning, so people weren't looking for it. Uh, but he, he was, grew up in the South, uh, like a lot of black people that Isabel Wilkins talked about in Warmth About the Sons, he was a sharecropper. Uh, so he dropped out of school in the third grade. But he was one of the wisest and kindest and loving people I've ever met. Uh, he had the kind of education uh, that we all should really uh, reach toward. Um, hmm. And I think of another book, there's a book called Somebody Else's Children. And the gist yeah. of it is that we don't have the responsibility, I mean, it's, it's, it's a provocation are we responsible for somebody else's children, educating somebody else's children? And on one hand, there's no such thing as somebody else's children. They're all of our children. That's right. That's right. Well, the basis for the fact that the human species has been able to get as far as it has. I mean, we fly, you know, we swim underwater. I mean, technology has gotten us there, but the reason we've gotten there is because of collaboration. Right, cooperation. Not competition. It is, I mean, competition in, in, the, in the economic sense, but in terms of producing these things, it's all by collaboration. It's, it, that's in our DNA. We wouldn't have survived as a species if we didn't collaborate together. Unfortunately, it's led us to world wars and all kinds of other horrors, but it is in our DNA to collaborate in order to survive. Right. And we have to make that the lodestone right. of our 
movement forward. Right. We have to yes. emphasize that every time right. in order to get to the point where we understand that it requires everyone's collaboration, everyone, right. Right. in order to get mm -hmm. anywhere. Yeah. And we it's stand even on more the shoulders now. of giants, right? right? I mean, there's yeah. no way Jeff Bezos would be anywhere where he is, you know, if he didn't have all of the rest of history behind him. That's right. Mm -hmm. I and think maybe the reason he got in that rocket is he was looking for the North Star that you guys. <laughs> <laughs> he, wanted, he, he wanted to buy it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to own the property rights. Yeah, right. <laughs> he and Richard Branson are fishing together. <laughs> but I think the, uh, the the questions that you're you're raising and and that all all children are our children. Mm -hmm. as distinct from that kind of inside my walls, the ones that I brought into this world biologically are the only ones I have to care about. Right. That just doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. I understand taking care of them. I understand that there's, you, how would I say, sometimes when there's public goods, they get underprovided. So having families step up for their own children is not necessarily a bad thing, but not to the exclusion right. of okay. the common good. And uh, I think that's what your, your report in many different dimensions really bring, brings to life. And, uh, and these uh, are radical ideas and they're not radical at all. I mean, yeah. think about literally there are five states in the United States that are actually commonwealths. Commonwealths. Just think of the term commonwealth. The wealth belongs to us all. Now, we don't live that anymore. We, and, and so Pennsylvania is a commonwealth. We don't, we don't, most people don't even know that anymore. Uh, and, and to Giselle's point, point um, in a number of books, but including Harari's book, Sapien, he argues that one reason Homo sapiens outperformed Neanderthals was not that Homo sapiens were bigger or stronger or individually smarter, is that Homo sapiens learned to cooperate. That's right. That's right. Yeah, there's a gentleman, I think his name is Christakis at Yale, who presented uh, a talk in our San Francisco INET office one day that resonated with exactly the same thing. That uh, the capacity to collaborate makes you, in a Darwinistic sense, more likely to survive That's and right. thrive, both. That's both. Right. And, uh, so let's talk just now for our audience. They've been getting a taste of this, but we're about to release this report. I think sometime around the 8th of September, the day after Labor Day in the United States and around the world, all of our team can use their social media. This podcast we made and several of the members of our team will go do a little, I'll do more podcasts, what I'll call deep dives in some of the segments around the North Star vision that you created. There'll be different neighborhoods in the North Star, I guess, and, uh, <laughs> or not necessarily different. All the neighborhoods will be treated the same, but they'll have yes. different dimensions. All the neighborhoods. But, uh, will be <laughs> but, uh, but I think I think this was a fantastic exercise, both just for clarity, but also you're filling a void. You're rising to the occasion when the anxiety and the temptation towards otherness and fear and other is rising. So in this respect, you were talking about heart-based education. This vision is a vaccination. And uh, I'm curious, as we'll release this, there'll be a lot of feedback and exploration. Do, as the two co-founders, do you have a vision of, a, of the next chapter after release, after feedback, after, as you hope and, and we all hope, it engages the world quite vigorously. What's, what's the next play? Well, it, it, in the best of all worlds, this would uh, precipitate the creation of groups of people who could talk to each other. Like, I think they were called, there was something going on in the 19th century like that, where Chadok was, or I can't remember the name of it. The name escapes me. But it was a, a way of people to get together like book clubs, right? But mm -hmm. on a much, much deeper and more important topic. 
um, I would I would hope it would start a movement that um, brought people together. I, there is a, a, a something called Better Angels mm -hmm. that I've gotten a sort of an but I don't know where it where it, it stands now. But a couple of three years ago, it was launched and started getting some play. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't heard much about them since the pandemic. Uh, again, you know, not being able to get together is a big drawback. Uh, but I, we need a national conversation about this. I mean, we need to be able to bring people into this uh, faith, people of faith, you know, people who run congregations. I would turn to them in the first place to bring mm -hmm. different congregations together, you know, because they have a moral standing with the people in the congregations. I would make it a discussion in, in high school classes, if we can get it into the curriculum somehow. It would be another way of getting children, young people, giving them the vision from the get-go, because they're the future. Mm -hmm. Without them, nothing happens. Okay. And John, I, I want to reinforce your point from earlier that while within the nation, within the communities uh, where we start to build, your hope was that this how they helps us see a North Star as a global community. Right. And I will say that is not only uh, important, it may be necessary, because I talked about that ring at the beginning, the healthy planet. Mm -hmm. We're not going to get there right. unless we cooperate. Right. to create the healthy planet. We're not going to inspire community. We're not going to take advantage of the learning that from people from different places around the world and different right. experiences. So there's a great deal at stake about this kind of vision, mm -hmm. this uh, notion that you call in the title, the foundations for a better society. I, I, I think we all agree they have right. to reach far beyond the borders of the United States. Right. But the United States, having been the metronome of a world system since World War II, is the essential starting gate. I agree. I agree. And, and going back to what you said, I, I mean, belonging is the key. Uh, how do we learn to really belong to each other? How do we belong to, how do we learn to belong to the earth, not dominate each other, uh, not bludgeon each other into submission, uh, but how do we learn to really know and, and, and not belonging is not simply saying belong in your own family. I agree with you, Rob, family is important, but we have to extend that. Uh, how do we learn to belong to people who disagree with us? How can you disagree with me and still be my friend? How can you disagree with me and I still love you and you still love me? How can you disagree with each other and still collaborate? Uh, those are some of the things we have to learn. Instead, we sometimes just emphasize there's one winner, everybody else loses. Wow, there you, go. Yes. There was uh, you know, we do that in a political system, we do it in a legal system, uh, mm -hmm. we do that with kids. Uh, you know, so um, I do think people want something different. Uh, and I think they're, they're hearkening for it. And I think so, if we could have these conversations, these experimentations uh, across the country across the world. I mean, if you think about a lot of the tech stuff that's come out, a lot of it was designed with the hope this would, this would connect people. And it does, but it's also been used to divide people. Yes. Uh, and so uh, I would also maybe look to the tech industry and say, okay, you have this tremendous platform. Uh, it could be for good or bad. Uh, right now the jury's out, it's, it's a lot of good stuff, but as you said, Rob, there's a lot of bad stuff as well. How do you begin to deal with that? Uh, and then finally, I would say the imagination. We, 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 we think about the past, and most of the time it's an imagined past because most of us are not real historians. We think about the past. We imagine the past, what it was like, and, but we don't spend enough time imagining and thinking about the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's not just imagining, how do we actually then build toward, work toward, orient, the future that I was saying that if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Mm 
so we have to have a sense of the future that we want and then begin to work to make that future a reality uh, as soon as we can. Yeah. Well, I'm going to uh, use your reference to my musical background and I'm going to take responsibility for creating the soundtrack that goes with this report. <laughs> and I can feel already that Aretha Franklin's song in the film Amazing Grace, it's a mm -hmm. Marvin Gaye song, Holy Holy. We've got to, it's like, we all have to band together. We have to believe in each other's dreams. Mm -hmm. But if you said to me from all of my experience related to music and traveling the world, when I sailed all over the world, I told my children I wanted them to see places where there were no roads and no airstrips so they could see what Mother Nature really was about. But I said even more importantly, and I was being a little facetious in this regard, I said I wanted them to understand that the most popular musicians on earth were not the Beatles, it was Bob Marley and the Wailers. Mm -hmm. And Bob Marley's song, One Love, One Heart, mm -hmm. Let's Get Together and Feel All Right. I'm pleading to mankind, one love, what about the one heart? Give thanks and praise to the Lord and I will feel all right. Let's get together and feel all right. Let's get together and feel all right. That might be the song that kicks off our, our presentation <laughs> because Bob Marley, I think, is the artist who fused politics, criticism, disagreement, all the kinds of things, and love better than any artist that I've ever experienced. Mm -hmm. So with, I think to conclude, I look forward to reaching out to some of our colleagues Again, on September 8th, we're going to release this report and we will have uh, opportunity for lots of discussion, webinars and so forth. I know I met, I know your institute will all be taking part in elevating this. But to close today, I just want to thank the two of you. Thank you for your vision, for your inspiration, for your effort, for including me. This has been a great experience. Well, thank you, Robin. Thank, it's been great just even this hour, but, uh, but also this project has been wonderful. And so I want to thank all those who participated and all those who will help make the future someplace where it's a great place to live. But a special thanks to Giselle uh, yes. for really spearheading this and uh, with her energy and insight uh, and wisdom. Yes. Thank you I both know. and thank you, John, for helping me get this off the ground. And Rob, I, you know, I've told you how much I appreciate what you're doing now and how you've taken hold of this and how you are planning to promulgate it. Uh, there's, I have no, no, uh, there's no way I could do that. So the fact that you're willing to do it and that you're so taken with this project is just incredible to me. Yeah, I'm sure Giselle with your vitality, John's expertise, There'll be many more times I sign up to promote your insights. They're really, really extraordinary. Anyway, thanks for today. To be continued. Okay. It was a lot of fun. All right, thank forward. you. And I'll leave the computer on for a while. Okay. <laughs>